our prayer today.
time for us to kind of just take take a step back from everything going on, all the busyness in the world, and just kind of just take take a breath. And so I would like to do this before we dive into the Word this morning. We got a lot to go through in Daniel Daniel nine, so I think let's just take a break, moment of silence, um, and then I'll pray and we'll dive into the Word this morning. Let's just remain silent for the Lord. Let Him search our hearts. Jeremiah. He calculated the years. 
mainly this 70-year prophecy that Jeremiah is given this prophecy for 70 years in two different places in Jeremiah. Jeremiah 25 and Jeremiah 29. It says in essence this prophecy says that the Jewish people that had been in exile for 70 years in Babylon, that eventually at the mark of 70 years, God will bring judgment against Babylon, it will be destroyed, and the Jewish people at that point in time will be able to return back to their home of Jerusalem. Now Daniel realizes in this moment that he has been in Babylon for roughly 70 years. He's been in Babylon 70 years, and he also notices that the kingdom has fallen. The Babylonian kingdom has fallen, and, and this is what prompts him to pray. He realizes everything that Jeremiah said in 25 and 20, 29 has come true except for one thing. The Jewish people have not returned back to their home. So he starts to pray that God would forgive these people, that, that he would forgive the Jewish people, and that, that, that God would act and not delay, and that he would allow them to return back, that there would be a new, uh, a new life in a way, a restoration of what has been torn down. Now, while Daniel was praying this, an angel, the angel Gabriel appears to him, and he tells him that he was sent by God to tell him how this prayer is going to be answered. Now, just think how cool this is. Can you imagine, like, you're praying for something, and then God sends an angel to you to tell you this is how your prayer is going to be answered. In detail. We're going to see a detail today. This is how it's going to be answered. Now, most of us probably will never have that happen. I'm sorry to tell you. We're probably not. Daniel only had this happen to him really once, a prayer answered twice this way, as we find out there. And, and, and the reason why the angel does this is because it's his prophecy. There's a reason why. Like I, like I said, every single week when we get into prophecy, there's a purpose to it. There's a reason why Daniel is given this prophecy we find here in chapter 9. It's for, for Daniel, it's for the Jews, and it's for us today. There's a purpose behind it. So with that, let's get into it. Let's get into it with angel Gabriel. This is him speaking. And what he is going to tell Daniel of how the events are going to un unfold before his eyes. And what he's going to give us is dates. So I'm going to let you know, and dive, we're going to read all of it, verse, uh, verse 24 to 27. It, if you're like me, I've read this passage about 50, probably 100 times, maybe, I don't know how many times. I've read this passage over and over and over again this week. I'm going to let you know, it's probably just going to get a little muddled together when we go into it. I'm going to unpack it after this, but. There's a lot here. These, these four verses here, 24 to 27, they're jam-packed in information. All right, so I'm going to read all of it, then we're going to unpack it after. If you don't have a Bible, make sure you, you grab one because it's in front of you. We don't put the main passage on the screen. Uh, we do this for all of us for God's word, together, God's word together. If you don't have a Bible at all, I encourage you to take that Bible home with you. So Daniel chapter 9, verse 24 to 27. Seventy weeks are decreed about your people and your holy city to finish the transgression put an end to sin, to atone for iniquity, to bring in an everlasting righteousness, to seal both vision and prophet, to anoint the most holy place. Now therefore, under, and understand that from the going out of the word to restore and build Jerusalem to the coming of the anointed one a prince, there shall be seven weeks. Then for sixty-two weeks it shall be built again, with squares and moles, but in a troubled time. And after sixty-two weeks an anointed one shall be cut off, and shall have nothing. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. It, its end shall come with a flood, and to the end it shall be war. Desolations are decreed. He shall make a strong covenant with many for one week. And for half of the week he shall put an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wings of abomination shall come one who makes desolate until the decreed end is poured out on the desolate. Once again, we come to a text that is really difficult. <laughs> I mean, totally honest, a difficult one. Um, and this is a very debated text among Christians. Uh, so I just want to gauge the room for a moment. How many of you have ever studied Daniel chapter 9? Raise your hand if you haven't done it. Few of us, okay. I'm going to guess probably most of us have never really delved into this that, that deep. Um, but how many of you have heard, have heard the seven years of Great Tribulation? Raise your hand. Okay, many of us figured that. I thought it was the abomination of desolation. Heard of this? Those, those terms, if you ever heard those, if you grew up in church or if you've been around in church for a while, those terms are a reference to what we find here in Daniel 9. They actually come from Jesus. Jesus puts these terms in, into play. When Jesus puts these terms, we'll get to the end of the text this morning. But when he, when, he, when he mentions this, he's mentioning Daniel 9. He's referencing Daniel 9. 
And I'm going to guess that when most of us hear those terms, seven years of great tribulation, or the great tribulation, seven years actually comes from this text. Why we think it's seven years? Um, and also, abomination and desolation. Most of us think those are future events, right? They're to come in the future. And it could be. I'm not saying they're not. It could be. But I want you to hear me out for a moment because I want us to stay in the text. I want us to stay in the text. And I want us to look at today's text with fresh eyes. Because as, as I've been leading us through this study through Daniel, this entire study, to look at the text for what it is, without preconceived notions, meaning our end time theologies, right? All the things you think about it happening in the end times, all the left behind books you watched and, 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 and read, right? I, all those, lay them aside. Lay them aside for a moment. And let's get into the passage. Because many a times what we find with end times, if you ever, if you ever stuck, look into end times and watch these movies, a lot of this is coming from different commentaries. And we take these commentaries and try to fit them into passages. We do it backwards. <laughs> We've got to let the passage interpret itself. We've got to, let, we got, to, we got to read this in context of when it was written and who it was written to. This has been my approach for Daniel all along to help us to know God's, God's word. And what we find here is, Okay, so this is what we find. How many of you are afraid of the end times? To be honest. Some of you are scared. If you, you watch those movies, they're scary. <laughs> and why is it scary? Because it sells. Right? It sells. It sells millions. It sells millions of books because fear sells. Right? It always does. I talk about this when most cults are surrounded around end times because it sells. It draws you in. Right? But here's the thing about end times. Here's the, problem. Here's the thing about Daniel chapter 9 this morning. We are not supposed to be filled with fear as Christians. There's no reason to be filled with fear. The whole point of the book of Daniel is to fill us with hope. To know that God has a plan through it all. That to know that God has, has given this book to us to, to for, throughout the years, for the Jewish people and for us today, to look at the future and have hope. Because our King, who is Jesus Christ, is ruling. He's ruling right now. And He's never going to be overthrown. He's not going to lose. Like this is the whole point of this text this morning in Daniel 9. Many have taken this to fill us with fear. There's no reason to be fearful of what is to come. Jesus is ruling right now. He will not be knocked off his throne. He will not lose in the end. So let's clarify a few things off the bat, okay? When we read this text, if you remember, who is Daniel praying for? Somebody yelled out. We have a lot of participation today. Who, who is he praying for? The kid people, the Jews, right? If you notice in verse 24, the 70 weeks, it says, the 70 weeks are decreed for your people, your city. This meaning he's praying for the Jews. This prophecy is for the Jews. And most importantly, this prophecy is for the, the, the finishing, the timeline here, the finishing of the transgression, the finishing of the sin, meaning the finishing of the judgment that Israel has incurred, the penalty of sin, because they broke the covenant. They broke the promise that they made with God, that God made with them. They, and they mainly, we may let you know, know that the Bible is broken into two different testaments, right? The Old Testament, the Old Covenant, and then you have the New Testament, the New Covenant. The Old Covenant has been broken. Then you knows this. If you look actually when he prays in verse 11, what's he praying for? Daniel chapter 9, verse 11 says, All of Israel has transgressed your law. All of Israel has sinned against your law and turned aside, refusing to obey your voice. And the curse and oath that is written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, has been poured out upon us because we have sinned against him. Daniel knows they broke the covenant. He knows this because he says in the law, the Jewish law, Deuteronomy 20, uh, 28 and Leviticus 24, there's a curse that will be poured out on Israel because they break the law, that they break this covenant. And the curse is exactly what you see happen when Babylon destroyed Jerusalem. But it was not fulfilled, though. Not fully yet. It was not finished. That's why this whole idea, the, the transgression, their judgment, their penalty of their sin, was not finished yet. There's still more to come. So Gabriel is here to tell Daniel how it's going to be finished. How the Israelites, the Jewish people, are going to be able to be forgiven that their, their, their sin is going to be wiped clean. How, how they can have a new relationship with God. How the old covenant that was broken, that they, that they broke, is going to be replaced with a new covenant. <laughs> That's not deserved by them. They do not deserve this. It's replaced with a new covenant. So let's just break this all down, okay? 
So we got this ring out. We got a timeline. Actually, I think I have the timeline up here. You have it in your notes as well. Yeah, it's in the program. It's a little different in yours compared to this, but just follow the timeline. Now, let's start with these numbers. We got a lot of numbers here. First thing to note, I'm going to say this, these numbers you find in the text, these are some first, first words in verse 24, 70 weeks. These numbers can be taken literally. Why they can be taken literally is you start looking in chapter, in chapter 9, verse 2, when Daniel is, is calculating the 70 year prophecy, he takes that prophecy literal. Right? He takes 70 years, not be a figurative number, it's a literal 70 years in the future. Now we have a few times mentioned here in the text, and they can be very confusing when you're just looking at them. Like 70 weeks, what is that? Now, what, what, when Daniel would hear this, this would be obvious for him. The, the difference is, is we're oh, uh, what, 2,500 years, maybe almost 3,000 years in the future. Okay? We're way in the future. We calculate time differently. The same thing, actually, I found this kind of interesting. Um, just generations, even, in this room, I guarantee you, calculate time differently. Like, for instance, quarter past or quarter up, right? Uh, I'll be honest, my generation, we don't really use that. Maybe some do, but I don't. I do not ever say quarter past, quarter up. But I talk to an older person, they use that time all the time. Eventually, maybe we'll come back, but usually what happens is we calculate time differently throughout generations. It just happens. So when Daniel would hear this, he understands what 70 weeks mean. He understands it. Now, way, the way we can calculate this is this. Just break it all down. 70 weeks can also be translated to 77. And what this actually, when this is mentioned, it, it's meant to be multiplied together. So 70 times 7. And 70, 70 times 7 is a reference to years. So if you've got any mathematicians in the room, what is 70 times 7? 490. 490 years. Right, when we read 7 weeks, what is 7 weeks then in verse 25? 7 times 7. 49, right? So you look at this, and you see these numbers, you calculate the first number with 7. That's the way it works. So 62 weeks, 52 times 7. One week would be 1 times 7, right? All these numbers, they all have a literal date to them. You're going to see this all just, just laid out so beautifully in Scripture. It's so amazing when you look at this. Look at this. So let's look at this timeline, okay? The timeline starts with, uh, if you look at this, it starts with the destruction of the first temple, and it ends with the destruction of the second temple, which you can't see, but it's actually in your notes, okay? That's how it ends. And what this signifies in this timeline, what we're going to find in this passage, is the end of the Old Covenant and the starting of the New Covenant. These two dates up here, 587 B.C. and 70 A.D., they represent this time period in a whole. So let's start at the beginning. Something that Daniel is reading in the beginning of this approximate prayer. Babylon, the third attack in the city of Jerusalem, he destroys the wall, this wall, he destroys the city. The Jewish people that were taken into exile, this time period is 587 BC, and when Babylon destroys the temple, the very start of this. So Daniel is calculating the time. As noted earlier, Jeremiah 25, Jeremiah 29, they talk about this prophecy that in 70 years, the Jewish people would turn back to their home. You might notice the timeline that 517 B.C., a decree was made by the Persian king Cyrus. If you do a math really quick, what's 587 minus 517? 70, right? It's the only start of all these numbers, and God laid himself so perfectly. The Jews were allowed to make the journey back home, which actually is amazing about this. What you can see is all the prophets... So the Bible, for somebody to say the Bible is not God's word, hey, you guys, you don't understand it. Every one of the prophets, they all link together. They all link together. There's no, there's no, there's no like contradictions between each other. It's so amazing. The prophet Isaiah, years before Daniel and years before Jeremiah, would actually prophesy that that God would raise up a king named Cyrus that would have great power and he would bless the nation of Israel. There's no coincidence here that Cyrus would be the one that no, Isaiah would no, no idea that there would be a man named Cyrus that would rise to power. That would be great. It would actually bless the Jewish people. Cyrus would not only make a decree that the Jewish people could return back to their home, but he also makes a decree that all the stolen out artifact that the, that the Babylonians stole from the temple were given back to the Jews. And also, this is amazing, the Persians, Cyrus, also, would also make a decree that, that they would fund the rebuilding of the city of Jerusalem. The Jews had no money. 
They were basically enslaved in Babylon for all these years. But the Persians would give the money to the Jews to rebuild the city of Jerusalem and rebuild the temple. It's truly amazing. It's all recorded in the book of Ezra and Nehemiah. So they return back and they rebuild the walls, the city of Jerusalem, and most importantly, they rebuild the temple. It's a very important thing. They rebuild the temple. Now we come to where Gabriel is going to finish the timeline for us. Gabriel now picks up here in verse 25. He says, you know the 70 years. You know what's coming. Now I'm going to tell you how it's all going to end. It doesn't end there. There's more to come, Daniel. So he tells in verse 25 that from the going out of the word to restore and build Jerusalem, this is referring to when Cyrus makes the decree in 517 B.C., but also there's more decrees. The last decree would be 458 B.C. by Artaxerxes, if you can follow all this. I know there's a lot here, right? Just try to wrap your mind all around this. 458 B.C., Artaxerxes would give the decree that the temple would be rebuilt, that he would fund the temple, right? Now, for, from that word, from all this going out, the Jewish, the, the Jewish people return back to is, uh, Jerusalem and the temple re being rebuilt. Verse 25 says, Then to the coming of an anointed one, a prince, there shall be seven weeks, 49 years, and then for 62 weeks, 434 years, it shall be built again. The city will be rebuilt with squares and moat, meaning the walls will be rebuilt. It's going to be a fortified city. Follow this, all this what's, what's happening here. Gabriel is giving some exact dates here. Exact dates. It's going to take 49 years to rebuild the Jerusalem. 49 years. The temple, the walls, the houses, this, this city that literally is literally rubble. This, the, everything tore down to actually take all this rubble or rebuild the city again. It's going to take 49 years for this to happen. And then after the city is rebuilt, for 434 years, it will stand. But it's going to stand in a troubled time. Remember back to Daniel chapter 8, we saw this troubled time. Antiochus IV rising to, to power, killing many of the Jews. Hundreds of thousands of Jews were killed, were slaughtered. They, they had war with the Greeks. And then, if you just think that was bad, then once they finally had freedom, the Jews then fight against each other. There was much civil war. Much bloodshed, much conspiracy and plots to kill different kings and priests. It was a terrible time in Jewish history. For 434 years, the city that is rebuilt, you think, great, awesome, look, the city is rebuilt, the temple is back, but it wasn't. There's nothing but trouble, nothing but bloodshed, nothing but awful, terrible things to happen. You look back in history, it's hard to see anything good in that time period. Then verse 20 to 26 says, the end, and after the 62 weeks, after the 434 years, there's a twist. A twist on the game was quite expected. Look at verse 26, it says, the anointed one can be cut off. He's going to have nothing. Cut off means he's going to be killed. And not only is the anointed one be cut off, but if you keep reading in verse 26, it says, and the people, the prince, who is to come to destroy the city and its sanctuary. This end shall come with a flood, and, and to the end there shall be war. Desolations are decreed. Not only is the anointed one to be cut off, but this city, this long-awaited city, that Daniel, at this point in time, he's living in Babylon, just wanting to see the city rebuilt, wanting to see the temple rebuilt. He's now told by the angel, this city you long to see, it's going to be rebuilt, and then it's going to be destroyed again. So it's torn down to the ground. Desolation to our decree means this is going to be a terrible time. There's going to be much bloodshed in this time, much tragedy. It's going to be a terrible thing that you're going to see happen. This is a twist I don't think I said. Daniel's not expecting this. He's expecting all good news. Like he's hearing the anointed one is coming. He's going to restore the Jews. The city's going to rebuild. Like, praise God. Awesome. After this point, every single vision you look at that Daniel had seen that's referring to this anointed one has all been positive. Like Daniel chapter 7, you look at this, he, he saw the Son of Man sitting on the eternal throne forever, never to be knocked off. And now, he's linking these two together, the anointed one, the Son of Man, now he's hearing, the Son of Man is going to be cut off? He's going to be killed? And the temple that is rebuilt is then going to be destroyed? This seems so out of place, right? And this is where things can get very convoluted. Because it seems like they don't match up. If you look at what I mean, you look at the, the first mention, the first text here, verse 24, it's 70 weeks, 70 times 7. 
is actually a picture of completeness. Seven is a number that means complete. So 70 times 7 is like an ultimate completion, the number of ultimate completion that's going to happen. It's the finishing and completing of Israel's sin, wiping it clean. The moment sin was forgiven, atoned for. Now Daniel probably hears this, and he's so filled with joy. Finally, Israel's going to be free of sin. Their sin's going to be forgiven. Praise God, right? But then Gabriel tells them, but it's not going to come until everything you know is torn down to the ground first. Everything you are praying for is going to be destroyed and turned into rubble first, and then I'm going to rebuild it. You imagine this, the, the prayer to praying for water bill, right? Imagine if, if Andrew Gabriel appeared last week, which would be awesome, right? He appeared to us right in the middle of the park and said, let me tell you, your prayers are going to be answered. First thing's going to happen, Waterville is going to be destroyed. Tore down the ground. Every city, every, every building you see is going to be laid waste. And you all, Christians, you're going to be persecuted. Some of you are going to die. Some of you are going to be thrown in prison. We, we longing for this. And then he gives us a date when this is going to happen. If, if we heard this, we would all be like, wait, what? This doesn't seem like it's, it's right. We were praying for you to restore a city. You're telling us you're going to destroy your city? You're going to destroy us? Like, whoa, 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 whoa. And here's the twist and that I don't think Daniel is quite understanding quite yet. And this is based on the news that Daniel has got. Everything you're looking at, everything you're longing for is going to be torn down to the ground. The Messiah, the long awaited Messiah, that's prophesied all throughout the prophets. It, it's prophesied at the beginning of the fall in Genesis chapter 3 that there would be one that would crush the serpent's head. Right? This is Jesus, right? The one you're waiting for. He's going to die. The Son of Man that's going to sit on the eternal throne. Before he sits on that eternal throne, which he is right now, the one with all authority and power, before he, that all happens, he's going to die first. It sounds very inconsistent. Until a person steps into human history and literally changes everything, he does the impossible. He makes this all make sense. Before this, this doesn't make sense. None of this makes sense. This can't make sense. You don't, you don't, you don't die and then rise to power. You don't tear everything down then to rebuild. That doesn't make sense. Until, until the anointed one comes. Until the Messiah comes. Hey, now look, just look at this. Look how this all just ties in together, okay? The angel gives us two dates here. We didn't give any dates yet. I'm just going to lay this all out. <laughs> 70 weeks, 490 years. Then you have the seven week plus 62 week period, 483 years. These two dates, these two times, they're going to intersect each other. From 458 BC, the final decree for the rebuilding of the temple by Artaxerxes, 483 years in the future, we land on a certain time period. Either around either 26 or 27 AD. For the sake of just, just lay it out, let's go with 26 AD. 26 AD. 490 years in the future from 458 BC, we land on a time period 33 AD. Let me just try to click all this together, right? This is, this is what I'm saying. This is so amazing. So amazing. The difference between these two dates is seven years. Verse 27 explains why we have these dates. Verse 27 says that, that we read the anointed ones make a strong covenant in this time period. The reference is covenant, a strong covenant. You make a covenant with just a certain group of people for one week or seven years. So it's all tied together. 483, 490, a seven year period between the two. The covenant he's making is with the many, it says in verse 20, 27. The many is kind of vague, but we understand the many very clearly to referring to the Jews. Follow this. 26 AD, the anointed ones make a strong covenant with the Jews. That's going to end seven years in the future. Let's nail this all out to give us all to help us understand this. Who is the anointed one? Somebody yelled out. Learn to make Jesus. It's Jesus, right? Very clear. Yeah. Jesus started his moment, started his ministry. Yeah. Anybody know roughly what time period this was? 26 AD. It started when he was baptized by John. 
Ross Baker says, 26 AD, after he be baptized by John, he goes into the wilderness, be baptized by John, the Father in heaven, says, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. The Spirit descends like a dove. See the Trinity all in the, this, this right this moment happening, right? He then goes into the wilderness, he's tempted by Satan. 40 days he fasts, he returns out of the wilderness, and this is the start of his ministry, right? 26 AD. And who is he ministering to in that seven year period? Who is his, who is all his disciples? Who is who 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 did he who did he preach to? Who did he perform miracles on? The Jews, even, even when he would minister to a non-Jew, the Samaritan woman in John 4, what did he tell her? For chapter 4, verse uh, John 4, verse 22. He says, Salvation is from the Jews. He says, A time coming when you you worship you do not know, but a time coming when you will worship me. But the time is not now. The kingdom is here now. I'm about ready to fill it, but not quite there yet. I'm here for the Jews. This is why Jesus and the disciples all knew. You go to the Jews first and then to the Gentiles. Jews first, then to the Gentiles. Even in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. And when Jesus ascends, he gives a command to his disciples, right? He tells them to go where? Jerusalem, Judea, then to Samaria, the end of the earth. Jerusalem and Judea are Jewish places. Jerusalem, the city of Jews, Judea, the region, the state you could say, full of Jews. You go to the Jews first. Then to the Gentiles. Even after Jesus ascended into heaven, where did the Jews, where did, where, where, did his, where did his disciples stay? In Jerusalem. They didn't leave Jerusalem. They ministered to the Jews. Now I'm sure, obviously, there's some Gentiles that were kind of mixing in here, but primarily they were devoted to the Jews. But a key event is going to happen. It's going to change literally, literally the course of history. And it changes Christianity. Stoning of Stephen. Stone of Stephen, which, which, if you look at the timeline, most agree, every scholar, almost every scholar agrees, it happened 33 AD. You know what happened after stone was stone, Stephen was stoned? Great persecution broke out in Jerusalem. You know what happened to the Christians? They scattered. And we read about, in Acts, Acts chapter 11, I believe, is one of the churches that were planted out of the scattering. Because as the Christians scattered, they planted churches. And they planted a church in one town we know of, Antioch. And where Antioch is? Turkey. A Gentile city. Not long after, in 33 AD, a certain person was converted. A guy named Saul. Who was Saul ministering to? The Gentiles. That was his mission. Seven years followed. 26 AD. 33 AD. Seven years. And the covenant, the strong covenant with the Jews, was over. They're now preaching to the Gentiles. And thank God, because I'm guessing most of us are Gentiles in this room. I don't know, maybe, maybe, some, maybe one of you are Jewish, but you're looking around. Most of us, I believe, are Gentiles. These dates are so incredible. Like, I've been reading this this week. Like I said, I, I have, like, this has been a really tough week, I'm going to be honest, just studying this text. I have stayed up late just trying to understand this. It's been tough. But when you tie this all together, it's so amazing. For, for the Jews not to recognize their Messiah, it is that utter foolishness. Like we have dates here that land precisely, precisely when Jesus would walk onto this earth. It's so amazing. Have you ever wondered why, just think about this, wonder why actually many of people in that time period when Jesus would walk the earth, they would be expecting Messiah? Can you imagine someone coming today and saying, I'm the Messiah. We're going to say, you're wacko, right? <laughs> you no, know you're not. Why do they accept this? Yeah. Obviously, before miracles and everything else, but why are they so eager to accept this? Why did the wise men, who were from the east, most likely they were students of Daniel's writing, why did they make the journey all the way to Bethlehem to, and, and looking for a baby that they believed was a king, the anointed one, the Messiah? Why did they think this? I'll tell you what, they could count. They could count. They read this and said, wait, wait, wait. Whoa, we're coming right up on it. Right? They knew it. They knew this was the race of the time period he was coming in. They expected the Messiah to come between 26 and 33 AD. They know he was coming. They knew he was coming. Now, here's the twist here. In the middle of the seven years, you find in verse 27, the anointed one, who is Jesus, is going to put an end to sacrifice and the offering. And how did the anointed one put an end to sacrifice and the offering? By doing the one thing that no one expects him to do, to be cut off, to be killed. This event is actually recorded more in detail by the prophet Isaiah. Like I said, all these prophets tie together. 
prophet Isaiah in Isaiah 53 verse 5 through 8 says this but he was pierced for our transgressions he was crushed for our, our iniquities upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace and with his wounds we are healed all like sheep we have gone astray we have turned every one to his own way and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all he was oppressed and he was afflicted yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before his shearers is silent he opened not his mouth Followers, Jesus became the end of the sacrifice. How? By becoming the sacrifice himself. The lamb that was led to the slaughter. He became the perfect sacrificial lamb that was needed to cut off the sin of Israel. To finally blot out all the sin, all the transgression, everything. He was pierced. He was crushed for our sins. <laughs> to bring us peace. To bring us healing. This is why the final words that Jesus said on the cross. What did Jesus, the final words Jesus said on the cross? It is finished. It is finished. Why do you say it is finished? The transgression is finished. The sin is finished. Look at look verse 24. Look how perfect this is. Right? It's the, it's the it's to put an end to sin. It's the end of sin holds. The captives are set free. The chains are broken because it was Jesus Christ did on the cross. It's the end of sacrifice. The tone for all iniquity. No sacrifice is needed anymore. We don't have to kill a lamb or goat or kill any more blood. The blood was shed for us by Jesus Christ on that cross. It's the start of an everlasting righteousness, an eternal righteousness. Because he can forgive. He forgives all sin. Not because we did anything right, because of his righteousness. He seals up his word, meaning the word of God is finished. There's no new revelation. We have everything. It's done. It's him. Everything is fulfilled in him. He creates a new temple. A new, he anoints a new holy place. A temple not built by human hands. A temple that's visible. If you look around us today, every single one of us as Christians, we house the Holy Spirit. We house the glory of God inside of us. We are the new holy place. This is why when Jesus died, the moment Jesus died, the temple veil was torn in two. The veil that separated the holy place from God, the holy place of God from man, was torn from top to bottom. The clear sign to the new holy place. I'm no longer residing in here. I'm making a new one. I'm starting a new covenant made with man. I am going to restore the relationship with God that's, that's not based on works anymore. Not based on doing all the right things, checking all the boxes off, but I am making a covenant that's based on a covenant with you, a relationship with you, that's based on what I have done for you, Jesus would say. God did something new. He's doing something new. He's done it. This is the start of a new covenant, a restored relationship with God, where the Spirit would dwell with man, where we would feel His presence, we would feel His peace, because the Spirit that's here right now in this room, that's residing in many of you as Christians, is in us. Because Jesus did it. He was cut off. He was killed. He became that final sacrifice. How amazing is it that we have this text? <laughs> Pretty cool. Now, as we transition, obviously we're doing communion this morning, and I want to kind of transition to this just kind of quickly here. There's a pattern we see in this text. As we move into communion, I want us to really think about this. God has to tear old things down in order to build something new. God has to tear old things down to build something new. You see this all throughout Scripture. You see it most perfectly here in this text. Not to get into the weeds, I, 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 I could keep going on on this, on this Da Vinci sermon. If you look at the end of that time, let's put the timeline back up a minute. Um, 70 AD. I would encourage you all to go home and read Matthew 24. Matthew 24, Luke 21, and Mark 13. Right? It talks about this. So Jesus references, where Jesus references Daniel 9. When Jesus references Daniel 9, he tells, he tells everybody that there, he tells his disciples anyway, that this temple you see, which, which was this temple, the second temple that was, that was rebuilt, the temple that was destroyed, 70 AD, he tells his disciples that they're marveling at this temple, Matthew 24. So you see this temple? Every single one of these stones in this temple is going to be torn down to the ground, laid desolate. 
When did it happen? Jesus tells them, Matthew 24, it's actually amazing. Most of us think Matthew 24 is future. It could be a double prophecy. Maybe it is, maybe it's not. But here's one thing Jesus does that's so amazing. He tells his disciples, not a generation will pass until all this takes place. Do you know how long a generation is in Scripture? Forty years. When Jesus says that, it was 30 AD. When the temple was destroyed, it was 70 AD. It is truly amazing when you look at this. You look at what Jesus said to us. We glance at all this. We try to put end time things like it's so, just look at the text and marvel at what God has given us. And it's going to come, once again, let's read this text. It says the flood, that I, it's, I, I can keep going on. Verse 26, it says, the flood will come again to the city. The way the temple was destroyed is when the city was surrounded by a Roman army. The Roman army would go into Jerusalem. The Emperor Titus would do the abomination of death that, that would literally lead to the temple being desolate, the city being desolate. He would sacrifice a pig on the altar, and then Titus would destroy the temple to the ground, literally tearing it from stone to stone. And here's what's amazing. Once again, God has to tear old things down to make something new. From that point on in 70 AD, the Jews have not made a sacrifice. They have not, at least not a temple. They have not. What was God doing? He was saying, it's done. This old covenant, this end. If you look at the title in Matthew 24, it's the end of the age, right? The end of the Jewish age is over. It's finished. I'm done with it. The old covenant is no more. We're in the new covenant now. I, Jesus is saying, I did it. It's a picture. We see that temple destroyed. If you go to Israel today, you go to Jerusalem today, you see that temple torn to the ground. It's a symbol that God says, I did something new. I tore this down to start something even more beautiful. <laughs> I did this. So if you could have your relationship with me, you no longer have to go to a temple. You no longer have to sacrifice a bull or a goat or a lamb. I did it for you, Jesus is saying. This is a sign for us when you go there today of what Jesus did for us on that cross. It's beautiful. But here's what I want us to do as we dive into, as we turn our faces and our minds and our attention to communion. Once again, God tears things down to make something new. As you move into communion, I want us, as we always encourage us to do, as 1 Corinthians 11 tells us, tells us to do, to examine your heart. When we, when, when we take the Lord's Supper, we remember the anointing one that was cut off, that was killed, that was the lamb that was led to the slaughter for us. We marvel at God's love for us. We are in awe of his mercy and grace for us. That's all seen so perfectly when Jesus would go to the cross to die. By his, because of our rebellion, he was killed, but he did it so we would be healed. He would do the impossible, and that he would raise himself from the grave. And he offers new life, restoration to all who believe in him. And I want you to understand something. Some of you might come in here broken today. If not, you love and will at some point find yourself broken. God will take what is broken in your life to build something back even better. It happens all throughout our lives. And sometimes we don't see it until we finally are entering the other side of the kingdom. But before we take communion, though, Scripture tells us, do not take this, this, this in an unworthy manner. So examine your heart. Confess any sins you have in your, in your life. What, what are the things in your life that need to be torn out right now? I guarantee all of us have something that needs to be torn out of our life, something that needs to be destroyed in our life. Ask God to show you what that is. Ask God in this moment, we're going to take in just a second here, to, to help you to hate the things that he hates, he, he hates and to destroy it out of your life. To make something new out of you. And I pray this would all, this would be something we pray often <coughs> as Christians in this room. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pray. The band's going to come up. They're going to play softly in the back. And as they're playing softly in the back, take the time. Confess. Pray, ask God to break, crush the thing that he hates in your life, and after you have confessed your sins to the Lord, come up, take the elements, let's sit back down, we'll take them together. And I will say this also, if you're not a Christian in this room, if you would not identify yourself as a believer of Christ, do not come up and take this. This is for believers, this is, and, and it actually tells in 1 Corinthians 11, 1 Corinthians 11, if you do this, and you're not a believer, you're actually casting judgment on yourself. But I also give, I always give this invitation at the end. Today can be the day you come to know who this, this Lord is. Today is the day you can understand who this guy is. You can have
have a new life. Before, even in this moment, you maybe it's the first time you confess your sins to the Lord and after you have done that, if it's your first time or your hundredth time, come up and take it together. Let's bow our heads and let's pray. Well, we thank you for how amazing the word really is. Sometimes we get muddy down and, and we look at things in so many different lights and we sometimes we just miss just how amazing your text is. How simple it is. <laughs> how you just give us the exact timeline, the exact dates of everything that's going to happen right in just so full detail for us to see. So we can't miss it. <laughs> you know, you're not a God that, that, that can try to confuse us. You're a God that makes things simple, makes it right in front of us. We just have to look and open our eyes to see it. Pray for all of us in this room right now that we'd open our eyes to see you. We'd open our eyes to see what you're doing in our lives. You see, what, see what you're doing in our community. I pray we take this time as we confess our sins before you that we would you would you would you would show us where we are failing. Show us the things in our life that need to be torn out. Show us what they are. And maybe for someone for the first time this morning in this room, they would give their lives over to you. They turn from their old ways. They turn from this, this old life they're living that's just leading them more into more and more misery. They leave that behind. They leave that old thing behind. They tear it out of their life. They use the analogy for John 15. You cut it out. Cut it out and build something even new. Grow something new in your life. I pray that you would see new life, restored life, transformed life, life, God, here today. Do a work in all of us, Lord. I pray that we can take this time and, and, and it will build us up, Lord. We love you. Jesus, I pray. Amen.